One of my favorite YouTubers is Grady Smith. He does a music review channel, but it's for country music. I've never seen anything like his channel. It's really cool, you should check it out. But the reason I bring him up today is because he recently made a video that was based off, I guess, a meme on Instagram. I never saw it. It was the albums that shaped your music taste. You're supposed to post 10 of them. He did a video where he went over 20 of them. So what I'm gonna do today is blatantly steal that idea. So here are 20 albums that shaped my music taste. So first on my list is from Dwight Yoakam. This time, the year was 1993. I was about seven or eight years old. This is actually the first CD I remember buying with my own money. Uh, this is one that my dad introduced me to. I wasn't allowed to watch MTV at the time. I know, deprived. So instead I watched CMT. I was raised on country music. I grew up in a small town in Texas, and I remember my dad showing me the video for Fast As You, and I just remember watching Dwight and his swagger and his being all smooth and cool and sexy. The song was more like a classic rock song than a country song, and the more you dive into Dwight's catalog, you realize that he was, for that time, really different. Even though he was going with that neo-traditional popular sound, and he was a popular artist then, he still was doing things that were just too cool, I think, for Nashville. So naturally, I was a big fan immediately. I always tend to gravitate towards people that are a little left of center, a little outside the box. I became a huge Dwight Yoakam fan in my early formative years, and I still am. Randy. So next up is Please Please Me by The Beatles, The Beatles' very first album. This is another one my dad introduced me to, probably when I was three years old. He had these giant speakers. This is like the 80s. He had one on each side of our home entertainment system. My three-year-old self would stand next to them and just rock out to The Beatles. I saw her standing there. The, <laughs> the speakers were taller than I was. The Beatles just have like incredibly engaging music. It's the perfect type of pop music for a young person to be introduced to. That was probably one of my first experiences that I remember listening to music, and it probably shaped me more than any other album. It, does, it means Beatles, doesn't it? You know, if that's just a name, you know, like shoe. Imagine shoe. the shoes. You see, we could have been called the shoes for all you know. I'm kind of doing these in chronological order. The next one is a double feature. I couldn't pick between the two because they both had such an influence on me at a very, very, very young age. But my parents had CD copies of Riptide and Heavy Nova from Robert Palmer, who was a popular new wave artist in the 80s. Riptide's the one that had Addicted to Love. Heavy Nova's the one that had Simply Irresistible. But I actually would listen to the entire album. And Robert Palmer was not your typical 80s pop star. He was really versatile with things he would try in his music. He had this signature raspy voice. The production was very 80s. I loved all the big, like, heavy reverb drums and the weird synth lines. I'd say that these albums basically cemented my love for music from that decade. I love the 1980s. It's my favorite era of music. The good and the bad, I just think it's one of the most interesting times in American music. The most influential record on me as a singer during that, the formative period when I first joined groups was Otis Redding Sings Soul Ballads. It was the first record I bought. I still listen to it. It's marvelous. So as you get older, your parents influence you, but then you start branching out and hearing music from your friends and maybe on the radio. And the first album I can remember that my dad told me to turn down the music because he hated it and it was too loud was the Space Jam soundtrack. The movie's great, soundtrack even better. My intro to hip hop was probably Coolio and he was on this soundtrack. I heard all his hits on the radio too. Hit Em High is such a awesome posse cut. It's basically got the all-stars of the time. Coolio's on there, along with Busta Rhymes, Be Real, LL Cool J, and Method Man. This was the perfect foray, the first intro to hip-hop music. If you're a young kid and you've never been exposed to that type of stuff, like I said earlier, I was mainly listening to country before then. Once my rebellious streak started kicking in, hip-hop and rap became a big deal for me, and it really just stuck with me after that. Boo. Ah! 
believe it myself. So my parents bought a new computer and it had Windows 95 on it. And something that maybe people don't remember about Windows 95 is that it came with some pre-loaded multimedia files. And one of those was the video for Buddy Holly by Weezer. My parents loved this video because the whole thing takes place in an episode of Happy Days, directed by Spike Jones, a classic music video. But I loved the song. I thought the Weezer were so cool. They had these huge pop hooks, big loud guitars. This was at a very young age, but I just remember thinking, God, these guys are awesome. It was probably my first introduction to quote unquote alternative music from that time. Such a great song, probably still my favorite Weezer song. I think it was one of my babysitters or maybe a tutor or something. They had the whole album, they had the blue album and they let me borrow it and I, I don't think I burned a copy on CD. I don't think you were able to do that yet. So I probably put it on cassette tape. God, I'm so old, but I listened to that thing. I probably wore the tape out. Now a big influence in my life was my cousin, Joe. Joe lives in Arizona. I live in Texas. So we didn't get to see each other very often, but when he would come for Christmas, he would always bring his collection of CDs, and he was big into alternative rock music at that time. He was probably like 16, 17 years old. I was probably like 9 or 10 years old, and one CD I remember he had that he let me listen to that blew my mind was Pork Soda by Primus. Do me a favor. Pause this video, go to Spotify, put on this album, and listen to the first minute and a half of this album. It starts off with a banjo intro. And then it breaks into Les Claypool's signature bass slapping for their hit song, My Name Is Mud. It doesn't even sound like a bass guitar. Like at this point, you have to imagine, I'm like 10 years old. I don't know much about bass guitars and I've certainly never heard a bass guitar make this sound. Not to mention the album in itself is just very dark and foreboding. Les Claypool has this signature cartoon character style vocals that you either love it or hate it. Definitely an acquired taste. I love it. And I think they were the first band where I really learned to appreciate wit in your lyricism and also a lot of dark humor and storytelling. Les is a great storyteller. Where are you going, city boy? And then Cousin Joe let me listen to Evil Empire. Rage Against the Machine immediately was a huge part of my music development because they were mixing in a style I had already discovered by myself, hip hop, with loud, heavy, hard rock. It was probably the most overtly political music I had ever heard, which also had a big influence on me. I had never been exposed to leftist politics and rage are about as left as you can get. Naturally, this music pissed off my mom and dad, so I loved it. The guilty parties are back. Zach, Tom, Brad, and Tim. Armed with their chart-topping second effort, Evil Empire. Next one is Dookie by Green Day, which I think is probably on a lot of people's lists, people my age. Green Day has had such a huge influence on me. This was one that my cousin Joe gave to me too. He actually gave me his copy because he said that he hated Green Day because they sold out. They weren't true punk. I was 10 or 11 years old at the time. I had no idea what he was talking about. All I know is that I had heard When I Come Around on the radio and thought it was so great. I loved Billy Joe's bratty vocals. I loved the driving punk loud sound, and I loved that they still had a pop lean to their music. Basically, they sounded like a loud Beatles to me. Dookie, of course, front to back is a masterpiece of its time. It was the gateway into my punk phase, which is still a big part of my life. I'm telling you guys, Cousin Joe, big influence on me. He also had the Deftones, which was a whole side of hard rock, heavy metal that I had never heard before. They were so ethereal and shoegazy and their production was so overwhelming to the ears. And it just, I just fell in love with them immediately. I was a big new metal kid when that was happening. So I did listen to all the regular people like Limp Bizkit and Korn, but there was always something special about the Deftones. Around the Fur 
basically showcased that the Deftones were here to stay, that they had that the Deftones had more staying power compared to their peers in that genre. Their music's just beautiful. The juxtaposition of Chino's vocals, whether he's screaming or singing, the music has this loud, enveloping soundscape, which is something that would stick with me as far as preference throughout my entire music-loving life. It had this introversion to it, which really spoke to me. Most of music of that type, like new metal especially, is very aggressive and in your face, and Deftones just weren't like that. They were always different. Our, our music usually jumps from, you know, from straight aggro-ness to just being, you know, really sweet and, and crooning. So, I mean, it, our music has a lot of dynamics. In Which I think is where Radiohead comes in. OK Computer, that's the next one. The first time I'd ever heard about Radiohead was I read a review in my local newspaper. They had an alt-weekly come out that was for teenagers called Generation Y. And one of the teenagers wrote a review praising OK Computer. And I thought, what a weird name for an album, OK Computer. So the next time I was at the CD store, I actually bought it. No idea, had never heard a note of it. I'm probably like 11, 12 years old at this point, just trying new things. This is probably my first foray into indie style music. Not really what you'd hear on the big rock radio stations, more like what you'd hear on college radio which I was starting to get into a little bit. It was maybe the first album I remember having to give it repeat listens to really dive in deep and really experience and appreciate it. It was my first foray into music that was more critically acclaimed and also the first band, I guess, that developed my music snob tendencies. I felt way ahead of the curve compared to my classmates. They had never heard of Radiohead or any music like this. Better, happier. More productive. As I got more into my teenage years, we're, we're talking 7th, 8th, ninth grade, my childhood friend Ryan, he was also really big into music, but he was a classic rock guy. He was into Eric Clapton and Pink Floyd. He, he, he introduced me to those bands. We would have sleepovers and we would just listen to classic rock radio pretty much all night while we were playing video games. Just like learning about Queen and Zeppelin and <laughs> Fog Hat together but one band that he introduced me to I think he learned about it from his dad was Steely Dan he let me borrow his copy of Asia and it transformed my life I'd never heard jazz sounds in rock and roll like that before I'd never heard an album so immaculately produced like that this album is well known for those things but you gotta understand from like a preteen who'd never really heard like horns and rock and roll like that, except maybe the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones or something. This was totally different. Again, it was for, for a kid that age, it's a challenging listen, but you can tell it's rewarding. Like it's gonna be rewarding. I love Steely Dan. I love the music they've made. And Asia sealed the deal for me for being a huge fan of them. Whenever I listen to Asia, I always, I always think of Ryan and those times that we had together. The Asia and the X game soundtracks. He had he had the compilation CDs from when X Games first came out. They made these alt rock comp CDs that were so badass. I had an electronic phase when I was in high school. I remember going to the record store and an employee there who was older than me, I was asking him what I should listen to because I was getting into the Chemical Brothers and Fat Boy Slim and and the record store employee told me to listen to music for the Jilted Generation by the Prodigy because it had an array of different styles of electronic music that was popular at the time. It was kind of a catch-all and introductory course. He said it was their best album in his opinion. This album really was the beginning of my experience with electronic music, particularly what I prefer, which is sample heavy and beat heavy. They weren't the most highbrow of their genre, but they were the most fun and aggressive. And at that age, I just couldn't deny a sound like that. I'd always heard top 40 electronic club music like LaBouche and Real McCoy and Aqua and stuff like that. But this was something completely different. What we're dealing with here is a total lack of respect for the law. I've always been a proud Texan. I'm not a big fan of the politics. I don't think I've ever been, but I've always been proud to say I am a Texan because there's so many significant, distinct things about this state and living in it that you can only 
really appreciate if you're from here. And I think part of that is the music. My dad was a giant ZZ Top fan. And I always tell him that ZZ Top is great, but my generation ZZ Top, basically the band that made it big, but had a twangy Texas version of what was popular at the time in rock music. That band for me, for my generation is the Toadies. And Rubberneck is the album. Once I heard Possum Kingdom on the radio, I knew that they were different. I figured they had to be a Southern band. This is one of those bands that has followed me into college and beyond. I've met so many people. I have so many lifelong friends that have loved this band as much as I do and that I've bonded with. Shout out to Don. Shout out to Lawrence. Shout out to Jared. I think if you're of a certain age, Eminem was a big part of your music diet. At the time, he was the biggest thing maybe in the world. Now that seems very problematic. A lot of Eminem's catalog hasn't aged well, and his lyrics certainly haven't. And the fact that he's kind of doubled down on that in recent years hasn't really helped much. But man, when I first heard the Marshall Mathers LP, I was at the right age where that just made a huge impact on me. And I think most hip-hop fans my age will say that that album was the one that started it all. I wouldn't say Eminem is somebody that I come back to a lot, but it was very formative for me. Say what you will about Eminem's lyrical content, he is an incredible lyricist. As far as bars go and technicality, he's one of the greatest rappers that's ever lived. So yeah, I had to put Eminem on here. Tower Records told me to shove this record up my ass. Do you know what it feels like to be told to have a record shoved up your ass? When I first uh, went into college, I worked at a college radio station and the people there had a big impact on the type of music I listened to. I really got deep into my indie phase and it really all started with Battles and the album Mirrored and specifically the song Atlas. You guys, you guys remember blogs? I would scour tons of blogs for new music and I found this one on a popular blog whose name I can't even remember. They had the video for Atlas on there and they're in that giant reflective cube and the drummer's cymbals are like six feet high in the air and he has to jump up to hit them. Also their sound was just so strange but funky and danceable. You ever just like something's happening and in that moment you realize it's a catalyst for something? That was me sitting on my laptop and watching the video for Atlas. So yeah, this was a big moment for me. It's when I went full indie college hipster kid. I think it happens to most of us. And for me, it started with battles. Earlier when I talked about the Deftones and their, their soundscapes that were so enveloping and perfect for headphone listening and they just wash over you, and you remember how I talked about my love for 80s music with Robert Palmer and stuff like that? Well, it all kind of came together with M83. Once I discovered the album Saturdays Equal Youth, which again, this was a college discovery from my college radio station, I remember hearing We Own the Sky on the playlist on the radio one day and just being enthralled by how much it sounded like it came from the 16 Candles soundtrack or something. It just put me in another world listening to that music. I still feel some type of way whenever I put that album on. Anthony Gonzalez and his cinematic production has something that has always stuck with me. It makes me feel incredible when I'm listening to it and nostalgic and winsome and all the things you feel when you're thinking back to a time that doesn't exist anymore in your life. The regrets and the joy and the heartbreak and the love and everything that entails that is in his music for me. It made me, the first time I listened to it, it made me feel nostalgic. And it was the first time I was ever hearing it. So I knew it was powerful music for me and it's still stuck with me. I'm 15 years old and I feel it's already too late to live. I'm telling you guys, like the 80s are huge for me. When an entire subgenre of people making lo-fi, tape hiss, sample heavy, danceable 80s influenced music came about. I'm talking about Chillwave. I was all in. The first time I heard Neon Indian was Deadbeat Summer and I heard it on satellite radio. I was working as a security guard and I was sitting in my car and the song came on blog radio 
for Gorilla vs. Bear on satellite radio. At the time, I was just, it was summertime, and I was having such a hard existential crisis at that point. It was just my soundtrack for that summer. Just this hazy, lonely, apathetic, we're deep in a recession type music. I couldn't get a real job. That whole album, Psychic Chasms, really got me into the chill wave scene. And though that scene kind of died out pretty quickly, I think it has, it still has a huge impact on music today. That type of music, and especially Neon Indians music, soundtracked a very important time of my life that I always look back and remember fondly. This one's more recent, Settle by Disclosure. It makes me feel some type of way. It's one of the best albums I've heard in recent memory in any genre. Maybe as I'm getting older, I get more nostalgic for the music of my youth, but this album just made me think of all those big radio hits, those electronic radio hits that were house and club heavy in the 90s that I always heard in my mom's car. But this was updated and it felt very fresh and new. Disclosure has a lot of diversity in their electronic styles. This album is flawless in my opinion. Another new one I'll mention is the PC Music Volume 1 compilation. This whole collective was introducing a new pop sound that I was, I was all in for. When I first heard it, my brain melted. I'm always a big fan of watching pop trends and how pop music develops. PC Music have been the most radical in recent years in terms of their music and their roster of artists and the type of music they're producing. Artists like Sophie and A.G. Cook. I love labels and collectives that are distinct with a certain brand, a certain style, a certain sound. For a label that isn't necessarily new or unusual to do, but it really becomes harder in modern times to stand out with the internet and things like that. And you don't see a lot of labels doing it as much as they used to because they have to worry about sustainability. So it's really cool to see something like PC Music and their style of pop really tailors to what I'm into, which is left of center, a little off the beaten path, and super weird and loud. One final one I want to mention here is the 1975. I kind of missed the boat on these guys initially. I don't think I was the right age group. They were initially seen as a boy band, but it's clear that they've really come into their own as a big, brash, cohesive pop band, alternative band, whatever you want to call them. They have exactly the type of sound, style, and aesthetic you need in the times that we live in not genre specific, very visually on brand. As you get older, you focus more on your professional life and you, you start to see how other people are doing things. And for me, the 1975, not only their big 80s sound that of course I love, their big pop sound, which of course I'm totally all about, but their branding, their aesthetic, their style, the way they do things, the way they say things, that has major appeal to me too. Their album, A Brief Inquiry into Online Relationships, I think is when it really all came together the most. Even from song to song, the aesthetic and the visualizations will change, but they always seem to have it all figured together and it still feels very cohesive. You know it's from this band. And that's from an audio and visual standpoint. They are truly a 21st century band. I love groups that can do this type of thing and keep it interesting. And for the 1975 and Matty Healy and the whole brand, so far so good. Keep it up. What genre of music is the 1975? Yes. What are some bands and albums that shaped your music taste? I'd love to hear them in the, in the comments. Also like and subscribe if you like the video and you want to see more of me and my ugly mug and my crazy quarantine hair that I refuse to comb. I do shower though. I shower. All right. Thanks for watching, guys.